Um, well, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee, I'm calling this meeting to order at six o'clock on the dot on um, May 26th. <clears throat> and our first order um, uh, item on the agenda is to approve our minutes from May 19th. Oh, I, before we go in, <laughs> roll call vote. And then also acknowledge that we are being recorded and live streamed on um, Amherst Media. Thank you very much, Amherst Media, on channel 15 in Amherst. Um, so uh, we'll call it. Just a few minutes. I just want to give private another two minutes to get more people on the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that is um, um okay, <laughs> Mr. Harrington? Thank you, Present. President. Miss Spitzer. Present. Miss Lord. Lord present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. And McDonald present. And we also have Dr. Morris on the line, um, and Amherst Media. Um, so, uh, moving on back to um, approving minutes of May 19th. Did anybody have any comments or edits that we can pass on to Cielo? Seeing none. Mr. Harrington, did you want to say something? I can't tell. No, okay. <laughs> Mr. Demling? I move to approve the minutes of May 19th, 2020. Moved by Demling, I'll second that, seconded by McDonald. Any further discussion? No, seeing none. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Okay. Passes. Oh, McDonald, aye. Um, so uh, the minutes are approved, 5 0. And now uh, we'll move on to public comment. And as a reminder, um, uh, public comment may be submitted um, either in written form, audio, or visual file to, an, to email my email address, mcdonalda at arps.org or by leaving a voice message um, on our Google voice number and um, we will play the recording or show um, the message. And we do have one comment um, that came in on our phone number and so I will play that now. This is Tony Cunningham in Amherst and this message is for the Amherst School Committee, the elementary district. I wanted to second what Carrie Spitzer proposed at the last regional school committee meeting namely that repairs to ventilation systems in the schools be prioritized for capital spending. As Kerry mentioned, much of the recent writing on limiting COVID transmission indoors has referenced proper ventilation. So I feel strongly that any work needed to keep air flowing in classrooms and ensuring windows can open and have screens attached should be high priority. Therefore, I would urge you to ensure the funding for HVAC equipment replacement at Crocker Farm and the other schools be included and for the school committee representatives on JCPC to push for this. Many thanks. And as mentioned, um, that was the only comment that we received today. So we'll move on to uh, new and continuing business. And our um, uh, first item is the budget vote for fiscal year 21. First, so I'll start and turn to uh, Dr. Slaughter. You're not going to see a lot of change from what was proposed previously. Um, I think the only thing you'll see is that there was originally um, some funds that were planned to be designated to special ed stabilization account um, or special ed stable account for the Amherst Elementary School District is in pretty good shape. So uh, we're building in, the, the more we learn about next fall, uh, the more we realize having some contingencies in place is gonna be important. So it'll allow us to um, have a little more wiggle with the additional costs that are certainly sure to come uh, as we head towards fall. Other than that, there are no changes to the uh, what the budget as proposed um, for the operational budget, which is the only vote that's up um, 
the only budget vote that we're asking for tonight. I don't know if Dr. Slaughter has any more that you'd like to add. And there is a motion. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. Um, it's uh, quite simply, uh, I'll, I can display it on the screen if that'd be, if you'd prefer, Ms. McDonald? Um, sure. Okay. Um, Ms. Lloyd, did you have a question? Um, I could make the motion, I could move, I can make the motion if you want. Okay. It's, okay. I move to adopt a budget of 23912452 for fiscal year 2021 for the Amherst Elementary Schools. Moved by Lord. There's second. Second. Moved by Lord and seconded by Harrington. Are there in, is there further discussion question comments, uh, Mr. Dimon? So slightly off topic now that we're within the motion of the operational budget, but can you explain why we're not seeing a capital proposal tonight, where we saw one last week? So uh, I can jump in and, and um, actually, could I pause uh, for a, another topic? I think Mr. Mino is, I guess, here for the region meeting, which will start at 6.30 and there's an Amherst meeting at the same length that's happening beforehand. Yes, I, I noticed that you attending, so. <laughs> so I think if you came back to the same link in 15 minutes, I think you'll be all set. We can't hear you because you're muted, Mr. Menino. I will leave. I just joined early because the last time I couldn't get in. I will try again. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon. Um, so um, is it okay to answer the question now or we push yes. it to the chair or would you prefer I wait till after the operational? Oh, um, yeah, let's, let's actually see if there's any other co comments from the committee on the operational budget and then we'll come back to that. No further discussion? Mr. Demling? Yeah, um, so can you explain again, I think you mentioned this at uh, another school committee meeting that we all sit on, um, but there's a slight um, difference in one of the budgets being slightly above level funded and the other one being slightly below and that it works out in the wash and it's due to the way that charter school reimbursements are accounted for with the town. Could you just re, re, re clarify slash state that? Thanks. Uh, Dr. Slaughter, you like me to do that or would you like to jump in? I'm fine either way. Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to make a rather long and, and com fiscally complex story short, uh, the Amherst uh, municipal budget um, takes on the charter school cost and then the Amherst uh, elementary district reimburses the town for that cost. Um, and this year, because we had a decline in charter school students, um, we actually had a, a, a 3% or 0 0.03 uh, increase to our budget. So originally the budget guidance was 2.5% increase and ours was 2.8. Uh, and that was due to the lower than anticipated charter enrollment last year. Um, so where we landed with the town is because of uh, multiple factors, including another uh, educational budget that the town has to support. Uh, the town has worked with us so that the Amherst Elementary School budget is slightly above level funded. And um, I can say the regional budget is slightly below the way the assessments work out. In the end, it works out um, very essentially to be a wash from the town's perspective, uh, but it's a really helpful difference for the Amherst Elementary Schools um, to be slightly above level funded. I get that Thank right, you. Doug? Okay. Mr. Demlin, did you have another? No, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, the motion has been moved and seconded, um, so we'll roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Uh, so the motion on the budget passes uh, five to zero. Uh, we can circle back to the question on the table about the capital budget. 
Sure. So in the capital budget, the way the process works is the staff here propose a capital budget, and then it, it goes through the school committee representatives and the joint capital planning committee um, to uh, talk about that with the other town departments, library, fire, police, um, to, to be involved in that. So if there is a discussion or report that a committee member wants to make uh, based on conversations at JCPC, we, we certainly, and it fits with, uh, within the topic of FI21 budget, to have that conversation. But as opposed to at the regional level where the committee actually votes on a budget, uh, the Amherst Elementary District does not vote on a capital budget. Its representatives bring the proposed capital budget to JCPC, and um, the attempt is for agreements to get hammered out at, with that group for how the town will spend whatever capital allotment there there is. Um, so, you know, I think for today's conversation, if there is a discussion or feedback that um, JCPC representatives want to have, we certainly can do that, but um, it's not something that's typically voted by school committee members. Um, but I, I, that all being said, I'm, you know, the, neither Dr. Slaughter nor I are opposed to that conversation. So, Ms. Spitzer? Yeah, so um, both Peter and I were at the JCPC meeting, and I, for one, would love to, not love, but I, I think it's necessary to have a conversation about that meeting, um, and I'd like to bring everybody up to speed on on how the JCPC meeting went um, with the acknowledgement that it was um, so the meeting occurred last Wednesday and based on the feedback from that meeting there will be another meeting um, tomorrow night and I believe it's starting at 7 15 it might be 7 30 I need to double check um, but so I'm gonna I'll give a quick update and then I, I have a feeling Peter will probably want to um, jump in so I we went into the meeting and obviously because of all of everything um, happening economically, not only in our community, but more broadly, um, I know that we've all been instructed to kind of cut our capital budgets as, as much as possible. And so the town initial proposal that was shared with us at this meeting, and this was not at all final, it was, it was they were seeking our feedback and I think they, they hopefully heard our feedback, but what they did is they essentially kept um, sidewalks and um you know potholes and, and department of public works items flat and then created um another fund for all of the other capital projects potentially in the town and that was put at about three hundred thousand dollars so um as a representative of the school we were uh, i think both peter and i were quite concerned about this proposal just knowing that in order for our schools to be safe for our kids next year we're definitely going to need um to make sure we continue to invest. And, and so one caveat here is that there is some federal funding through the CARES Act that will be available for anything that we can say, um, I shouldn't say anything, but but for items that are um, related to COVID-19. So potentially things like hand sanitizer or building plexiglass um, separations where needed, things like that. So in, in some regards, that's, um, that's positive, but it's not an unlimited pool of funds. So I do have some concern that um, we may need to even invest more than what might be coming down the pipeline through these grants. Um, but I'm particularly concerned about, um, you know, some of the items that we need to invest in in our schools to keep them because our buildings are so old and um, because we need to make sure those buildings are in ex, you know, in, in the best condition we possibly can. I, I feel really uncomfortable not doing some of the basic capital investments that I think I think we've identified um, as important. And what we discussed um, wasn't reflected in the capital budget in any way other than this three hundred thousand dollar fund that was going to be spread across all of the other agencies and um, departments in the town. So that was concerning to me. So hopefully tomorrow we'll hear an update that has balanced out, I think, the priorities of the town so that schools and things like the fire department and police are also included. Um, but I wanted to, and I'll let Peter add to that. And Mr. Emily. Yeah, um, so that's a very good summary and um, yeah, I, I think Ms. Spitzer already mentioned this, but it was it was the initial proposal from the town manager and the, the finance director who's been on board for eight days. <laughs> so uh, so they were taking feedback and this and I think the concern that Ms. Spitzer expressed was it was universal on the um, 
on the part of all the members of JCPC. Um, uh, I, I, the other couple of logistic things that that were concerning is that um, the that that additional resource fund of three hundred something thousand was originally envisioned as uh, as things come up over the course of the fiscal year that are COVID related. Uh, the schools and other departments would come and then ask for that money. Uh, whereas we we already know that we have must haves that we absolutely need to do now. And, 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 we, and we also know that some of these items, if we don't do them now, aren't gonna get done. Like for example, uh, if we if we wanna spend anything to shore up the Fort River roof, that's not something we can do in the middle of the school year. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm just so just going down on the, you know, we had that um, $220,000 capital proposal last week of those four different items. Um, and so um, what Ms. Spitzer and I were expressing and, and others were expressing for their own departments is, um, if, if this really is an absolute must have related to, you know, safety or security, um, COVID, uh, and you have to invest in it now, we need to know. So that's why I think in um, her summary email, um, Ms. Schoen, who's the chair of GCPC, uh, said that the uh, town was gonna go back to department officials. So it was gonna follow up with um, school officials about, okay, what are your priority items that you need to know so that we can take those four originally proposed items and and also talk about other feedback, you know, because there's been other conversations about the Fort River roof. We just heard a public comment about the Crocker Farm HVAC. And we really, for me personally, I feel like I, in, torn, in order to make an informed recommendation to the town council, I feel like I need a conversation of this group, by this group, I mean the school committee and Dr. Slaughter, Dr. Morris, maybe Mr. Roy Clark, um, about about what is now that that honed down, we know we have to have it before we go to the slush fund list. And the further complication is that this JCPC meeting is happening 24 hours from now. And, and our, our JCPC's charge is to complete its work um, before June 1st. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying not, we're trying to work with the process, but, um, I got the sense that even after tomorrow night, um, it, it wouldn't be um, out of place for a department like the schools to, or, or the school committee to express, okay, we understand this is the plan. That being said, we have A, B, and C that at a bare minimum, we feel like we need to fund for this fiscal year. So um, that's where, where we sort of left it. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so I had a conversation with Mr. Bauckham in a minute. I think the hard thing for us and I'll talk about this more next week when we meet, is that um, we're going to figure out what school is going to look like. Um, that's not like what it's used to look like. Uh, we have to school, figure out what, how we're going to use our buildings. Uh, there are some known costs that, again, I, I'm not going to get to put the cart in front of the horse, but I talked to Mr. Bachman about literally this this afternoon um, that we're going to need to do that. we They're not on our capital list because our capital list wasn't making an assumption that there was going to be a pandemic. Um, as we built it in. Um, and so we are gonna, and we've received no guidance from, we received CDC guidance a week ago and no guidance from DESE. Um, so the number of variables is right. And I agree with Mr. Demling's point that we can put forward what we think, but in terms of the evolving nature of how to open school, we're not gonna have answers to that by next Monday or Tuesday, whatever the first is. It's not gonna happen. Um, and so I expressed that to Mr. Bachelman and I think he's understanding. And I think the committee and the, the community will understand that uh, we haven't received all the guidance we would need to make accurate decisions about capital needs for next year. There are some things we know we're going to have to do. You mentioned a couple, uh, but even how we're going to do them, you know, that's going to be an evolving process. And there's some larger uh, items than the ones you mentioned that we're going to have to do as well. Um, so I, I felt reassured in my conversation. This is not to suggest that Ms. Fitz or Mr. Demling or the committee shouldn't advocate for things in the capital list, but I do think uh, I've been with Ms. Dr. Slaughter or Mr. Roy Clark itemizing some things that are. Um, not so small ticket items that we're going to need to have in place by fall if we expect students to return in the fall. Um, I don't know how to if that's helpful or not, um, but it is. Uh, I did want to express to the committee that um, I think town staff know that this is an evolving situation. Everyone's committed on the town that I've heard to making sure students return, uh, and there's some acknowledgement that we're not going to have all the answers in five days. Um, we haven't received the guidance we would need to even begin to have that that level of uh, confidence uh, in exactly what needs to be done. But that you're right, there are some things that we know are gonna need to be done and um, we received some assurance about that. Ms. Spitzer? 
Yeah, and, and I think this will be telling tomorrow is that, I mean, the, the fact that 300,000 was the entire amount for the for the full town was what was primar primarily most concerning. I, it's not a question of whether or not the town's dedicated to helping the schools and making sure that they can open, but I think the the, the scale was concerning. And it, yeah. it, it, felt, it felt quite um, unbalanced. Um, so, hopefully we'll get some good news that we can report back next week in terms of, of shifting kind of in the scales between um, our roads and sidewalks, which I believe are incredibly important, but <laughs> I also believe in, in, in all the other items um, on the capital plan are also valued. Yeah, and I want to support Ms. Spitzer's point in that all of our, I mean, I'll just be blunt, 95% of our attention from a capital side will be what are the things we need to do to open schools next year? And so it becomes easy to forget the maintenance things that if we don't do them two years from now, uh, they become larger problems or six months from now, if we've forgotten them, about them, they become larger problems. So nothing I was saying was trying to disagree with Mr. Demling or yourself. Um, I was really talking about the more the additional costs they're gonna, that the schools are gonna have to bear um, given CDC guidance, which again, I'll get much more detail about next week. And, and I don't wanna start previewing parts of that because, um, it's not ready to go, and, and I, don't, I don't think that's wise. Um, but I do think it's important that that's not all we do because our buildings are old and having nothing to do with COVID-19, they're still in need of repair. Uh, and we'll, we'll pay a larger price down the road if we're not taking care of the, the maintenance things um, along the way. I think we've seen that, frankly, in our schools. Yeah. Um, it, this is all great conversation. I don't want to close it, but because we know we have another meeting next week, I'm wondering if we can sort of wrap this up so that we can keep moving and be done in time for an, uh, another meeting that's happening in the same room. <laughs> um, is it, are, are folks okay with moving on? Okay. Um, so our next item is our, the superintendent evaluation timeline um, approval. So um, uh, Carrie, uh, um, we haven't connected, but would you, are you interested in, in teeing this up for the committee? Sure. So I think I've been previewing this in our last meeting. So I, I have been in touch with Sasha to hopefully get the instrument ready soon. Um, we need to have a, a vote in order to postpone the evaluation past June 1st is my understanding. Um, I don't, I wasn't going to make a motion for a specific date. Um, Unless, can we, do you have, um, yeah, you, I'll pull up could, the, you up, could you bring up the, uh, oh, we don't have the agenda here. We have, um, we originally had proposed June 16th, our June 16th meeting for artifacts and, um, June 18th for the evaluation submission from, so all of us to have completed the evaluation, um, and with a vote on June 30. Um, I might propose that we push out the artifacts presentation um, a little bit further, but um, potentially to the June 30th meeting. Dr. Morris? Yeah, I mean, certainly this is the committee's will, but uh, my recommendation for your, for consideration anyway is if you're going to take a vote tonight, and I agree with Ms. Spitzer that, that I think that's wise, um, not tying it to a specific date tonight, um, giving Ms. Spitzer more time to work with Ms. Figueroa on the tool and let that drive the process. I do also have a feeling that after next week's meeting, um, uh, the conversation is going to be about fall, uh, going to consume a lot of our time, energy, and focus. Um, so uh, I'm open, as I said before, I'm open to what the committee wants, but I, I do think maybe a more general vote and to be reconsidered once Ms. Spitzer has more time and, and the committee can, can think a little bit more about it might be warranted or wise. Uh, Mr. Demling? Uh, I move to postpone the completion of the superintendent evaluation uh, until a later date to be determined. Moved by Demling, um, I'll second that, seconded by McDonald. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, uh, Dr. Morris, are you amenable to that uh, proposal? Yeah, um, okay. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. 
Miss Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. And McDonald, aye. Thank you. Um, we had a warrants report on the agenda and I don't believe we have, um, or I <laughs> have any to report because I don't believe that I've signed any in the, uh, since the last meeting. So, um, and we just talked about uh, agenda planning. Um, we have an, a meeting um, TBD the week of um, uh, next week, um, tentatively June 3rd. Um, is, is what we have, um, that miraculously just showed up in the document. <laughs> <I'm looking laughs> um, and then our meeting on, um, and that the focus of that, uh, will be fall 2020 planning. And then June 16th, we have our COVID-19 school update, um, school building committee representative. Um, I'm guessing that's a discussion or Dr. Morris. Yeah, so um, it's uh, at that point, uh, there'll need to be an appointment of a school committee member. Um, and so it's required on the committee, the, on the, on the, uh, to be on the school building committee. And uh, it can be appointed by the chair, or it could be vote. Um, but, you know, by June, uh, by July 1st, there needs, the committee needs to be formed. So um, the town manager asked me to add that to an agenda so that he has who from the school committee will be on the building committee ahead of time. Okay. Any um, further discussion on agendas, meetings? Okay. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, do you, do you want to make a motion? I do. I move to adjourn. Lord second. Moved by Spitzer and seconded by Lord. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Okay. Um, so, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling this meeting of the Regional School Committee uh, to order at uh, 6.41 p.m. And um, we are now all here. Um, so, I will call roll call. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. I mean, Demling present. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Uh, Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino present. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan present. Ms. Stancer. Stands are present. And Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. And McDonald present. I believe that is all of us, right? Yes. Um, we also have um, uh, Emily Gribko here, our student representative. Yeah. Welcome. And also uh, joining us is uh, Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris. And we are um, being uh, live streamed um thank you to amherst media on um, channel 15 um, and we are being recorded um and it will be available on amherst media um, afterward um so our first order tonight is to um approve our minutes from may 14th Did anyone have any? I'll give a moment to uh, just to, uh, to refresh and, and review quickly, but um, if anybody has any comments, just raise your hand. Um, there was a place near the end where I think it said Mr. Seeger. I'm trying to find the, yes, under number seven, accept gifts. Oh, yeah. I it see. It say Miss Seeger. Uh, Ms. Spitzer, you had a comment? So on section E where it reads approve warrants, it just, 
it seems like there's some words missing. It says these warrants have been approved and we are from Ms. Fitzer about what was approved. I think it must be like we heard from Ms. Ms. Fitzer. Yep. Um, Ms. Seeger? On the under section A about the FY21 budget presentation and hearing, at the end of the page in the paragraph, the last paragraph, about six lines down, it says Ms. Seeger said that coming that this coming year Leverett is increasing their budget and therefore the 40k range is. Um, I, I believe what, what happened there is I asked Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter uh, what the difference was for Leverett. So it was a question. Got it. Okay. Any further edits? Mr. Denley? I move to approve the minutes of May 14th, 2020. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, no, in section eight, it's like real small, but uh, one, two, three, four. After the, okay, the moved by Demling, seconded by Harrington. Is there any further discussion, Mr. Harrington? <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. There's, there's a hyphen in Roy. It's, it should be Mr. Roy Clark, not Mr. Roy Clark. I, I, I would accept a friendly amendment to, to have it be moved as amended by Mr. Harrington. Motion is amended and seconded. Uh, okay, roll call vote on the amended motion. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. And Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. And McDonald, aye. And so the motion carries uh, nine to zero. Um, now we uh, move on to public comment. Um, and <clears throat> we do have uh, one public comment that uh, came in over the phone. Um, so I will play that. Tony Cunningham, Amherst. I wanted to second what Kerry Spitzer said at the last regional school committee meeting, namely that repairs to ventilation systems in the schools should be pr prioritized for capital spending. As Kerry mentioned, much of the recent writing on limiting COVID transmission indoors has referenced proper ventilation. And so I feel strongly that any work needed to keep air flowing in classrooms and ensuring windows can open and have screens attached should be high priority. Therefore, I would urge you to ensure the funding for the high school exhaust fans and applicable HVAC work on Summit Academy and PIP be included, and for the school committee representatives on JCPC to push for this. Thank you. Uh, that is the um, loan uh, public comment that we received today. And just as a reminder for the public, um, we accept um, public comment via email, and that may be email or um, an audio or video recording, um, and by phone, phone voice message um, at the number that is listed on our um, on our uh, agendas. Um, so long as they we receive them by 3 p.m., we will either display or play them back. Are there any committee announcements, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I just wanted to give another plug again for uh, Amherst Education Foundation and their fundraising efforts. Um, as mentioned before, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to do their spring uh, gala. And so one of their big fundraising uh, pushes is the um, Stars in Our Schools, where you can make a donation uh, in the uh, in honor of or uh, in the uh, name of uh, a teacher. And it really has a nice uh, impact on, on the staff. I, I just want to read a, a brief part of the quote um, that they have shared from um, Ann White, a music teacher from Fort River, who says, I've had the good fortune to be honored 
by parents and members of the Amherst community through the Stars in Our Schools donations to AEF. When making their donations, parents and relatives have commented specifically that they see their children singing with joy and self-confidence and that they have an appreciation for music of different world cultures. It's deeply satisfying to know that what we do in the schools gets carried out into the community. I just thought it was really nice that, you know, um, we could, there's an opportunity not only to support an organization that supports our schools, but to have that human connection, which is obviously a lot harder to come by, um, you know, during this time. So just another a plug for uh, uh, all the great work that AEF does for us. Thank you. And Mr. Demling. Oh, sorry, Mr. Harrington. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Demling. And now Mr. Harrington. <laughs> right. I I, I just kind of wanted to, I, I didn't mean for it to flow like this, but I, I kind of wanted to recognize the passing of AEF board member and, and Amherst educator, Susan Kennedy Marks. I just figured we should acknowledge that publicly. Oh my God. Um, yeah, and I think um, I'll just say I have a lot more to share about that at the next meeting uh, and more acknowledgement uh, once I have more permission to speak um, on the topic. Um, but I appreciate Mr. Herring to bring it up. And I think when we get to our meeting next week, um, it'll be a joint meeting. And, and I think at that point, I'll likely be able to comment more openly about that. Mr. Menino? When did Susan, Susan pass? So again, I'm going to ask just because out of respect for the family that we not go into more details than what Mr. Harrington shared. Uh, a reasonable question, well-loved person in our community and did tremendous work. And, and again, I think by next week I'll be able to uh, um, say what I'd like to say now, but I, I'm trying to respect the process um, and grieving folks. Um, so uh, if people could hold on that. Uh, we'll get together next week. And um, I, someone I knew quite well, and, and I'd like to share more information that point. Any other announcements? No? Okay. Um, moving on, um, actually before, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right spot, but we do want to make um, uh, a, a slight uh, agenda change um, to move things around um, because one member needs uh, to leave um has a has a conflict later on so we are going to um with with the committee's permission move the budget um fy21 budget vote and assessment method vote to be number one on our new and continuing business um item and the item f the bus contract vote will be second and then we'll continue back um go back to the covid19 school update and continue through the rest of the agenda in order um, is, is everybody, does that work for everybody? I'm seeing nodding heads. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, Dr. Morris. I'll be very brief, especially given that, uh, for the update. So just really two things I'd like to share. One is just an appreciation for Amherst Media. Uh, they're helping out this week, uh, with the high school graduation, uh, and, um, they're going to be out there on a very hot day for a long period of time, uh, filming lots of different things, students, families, uh, speeches by you know, Ms. McDonald on behalf of the school committee and a number of others uh, in indoor space. So I uh, just really want to thank Amherst Media. Um, we thought about how to honor and recognize the graduates uh, and got their feedback. It was critical. And uh, all these uh, in all these situations, everything's happening faster than anyone can keep up with it. And we really appreciate Amherst Media's support and professionalism in jumping in. So I want to publicly acknowledge that. Uh, the only other update that's not related to something on the agenda is that we'll have a decision on middle school principal, uh, the, the result of the middle school principal search later this week. Uh, but I really do want to take the time to uh, acknowledge and thank um, Dr. Joseph Smith and Ms. Rebecca Sweetman for jumping in to two-year interim roles uh, and really uh, transitioning the school and all their hard work, dedication, and problem solving uh, to move the school forward is greatly appreciated. And they um, just wanted to say that publicly as uh, we start transitioning uh, to thinking about fall. In particular, we'll start that next week. Uh, I didn't want to get ahead of ourselves and, and not acknowledge the work that Dr. Smith and Ms. Whitman did over the last two years at the middle school. And that's my update for tonight. Thank you. 
Um, and so moving along, a uh, cheers update. I don't have anything more to update at this point. So we'll move on um, to our budget and um, operation capital and uh, assessment method vote. Turn it back over to you. Sure. And so uh, you're, you won't see tremendous differences uh, from the last budget. The only difference was it, that you'll see is in the last budget, we did have um, some funds going to um, special ed stabilization fund, and we pulled those out and put them in to uh, increase the amount of state revenue loss we're anticipating based on uh, the longer it goes, the less confidence there is right now in a federal relief package that would support states. Um, I want to be really honest that you know we're, we're budgeting as best we can based on what our local legislators are telling us. And we don't really know what the future holds. One of my colleagues in Pittsfield came out and talked about what would be the impact if there was a 10 or 15 percent reduction in, in Chapter 70 in state aid. Uh, we very easily would be back at this table with more significant uh, other things to talk about. Uh, but I know the towns have requested uh, to have this information as soon as possible to plan for town meetings and town council in Amherst. And we're making our best guess on what this will look like. Uh, but the reality is the legislators aren't giving us much information. Um, so you can see that in the budget that's being recommended, we have close to $300,000 in reductions of state aid um, at a 10% number. That number uh, more or less triples um, it's in that vicinity. And we're having different conversations. So um, we've heard different things from different legislators to be very candid with you. And I think that's because it's an evolving situation. It's not because they're disagreeing. It's just hard to track especially as they're not meeting live and in person. Um, so uh, this is what we think uh, we can propose at a level level funded budget, which is requested by the towns. Um, you know, I think we, we're recommending that we stay with the 45% method. That's why there's not another vote on that. You already voted that in March and we would anticipate, um, that's our recommendation is we stay at that. Uh, but uh, particularly at the regional level, as opposed to in municipal, municipal budgets, when there's a, uh, a cut of state aid, it, it doesn't go through an intermediary, it goes directly to the district. And um, I think the other caveat I wanna offer is because we won't have an approved budget by all four towns by June 1st, later this week, Dr. Slaughter will be submitting um, uh, an acknowledgement uh, to DESE because they are mandating that any district without an approved budget by each of the towns uh, has to get uh, let DESE know so they can get ready to uh, apply a one twelfth budget if needed. Um, we're hoping that all the towns will support this budget. I think it's um, it, it's it's a tough budget for us to pass, especially given the number of unknowns we had as we head into next year. Uh, I think it's a reasonable budget. If there really are catastrophic changes to what we were hearing from legislators about cuts, we'll have to come back. Um, but uh, I do think it's you know as fiscally responsible as we can be given the number of unknowns we have to come. Um, but I think just the, the, the one change is reduction of special ed stabilization fund donation, not donation, but uh, that, that what we planned for, put that into anticipated uh, state revenue losses. Uh, wouldn't it inform you about the June 1st deadline from DESE, we will have to submit that later this week. Um, and uh, just really the uncertainty in the state budget and how at the regional level, as opposed to municipal budget, it directly affects um, the finances of the district. So those were the three updates. Dr. Slaughter, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. No. Any uh, questions from the committee? Mr. Dumling. Um, so two questions. One, do we have um, indication from the uh, elected officials of the four towns that the 45% method that we discussed last time that we seem that the committee seemed to be uh, in agreement with continuing to propose is is, uh, is is an acceptable level? I think I think part of our thinking was that if we proposed the same, that was um, the method that was uh, had had that had received tentative agreement from elected officials that that would be the, mo the likely outcome. And, and then the second question is on the, um, the HVAC Summit Academy and PIP item. Um, I, I, I do really appreciate the additional page um, of content um, that 
uh, was asked for from last time from a few members about the uh, additional descriptions on the, the capital plan modifications. Um, it's it's good to see the description in the exhaust fan item. Not that it doesn't have to be done because otherwise it wouldn't have been on the list in the first place, but that the air quality in the building is not impacted by replacement of the fans. Um, if you could, my question though is on the on the Summit Academy and PIP items, could you clarify but what it means that the um, uh, the remodeling of spaces has resulted in poor climate control. Um, not being an HVAC uh, expert, I don't really understand what that means. And uh, I don't want to delve into a nine layer scientific analysis of, of impact, but obviously we're thinking about COVID and health. And so uh, if you could just speak to that, because that, that's, that's an item got crossed out. So um, spoke with Mr. Roy Clark about this at, uh, the other day a little bit, and and uh, really by virtue of how they sort of um, repartition the rooms and the spaces in that section of the high school, um, I think their expectations back when they did that work was that uh, the heating, cooling, and all those spaces would be fine. Uh, they found by virtue of being in those spaces, it's not fine, um, and so there are rooms that are really too warm and really too cold, and and so it it's uh, you know sort of poorly you know moderated. Um, Relative to what they'd like to have in that area, and and I think you know if if we were able to take on a next project, that would probably be number one. Um, uh, it does require some significant you know uh, redesign, engineering of of space and and construction work to move uh, duct work and that sort of thing to to balance out the heating and cooling in those spaces. I think the air quality question is is fine. I think it's it's they can be uncomfortable at times. I don't think it's uh, and obviously as soon as we can fix it, we would like to just because the space has become uh, much more functional or more highly functional if they're properly controlled for temperature. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, I think it just underscores how painful this, this how to the bone we are cutting the capital request. Um, to you know, to know that we have kids that are uh, and teachers working in uncomfortable spaces, and that we're not going to be able to do anything about it. Um, <laughs> and also knowing what FY twenty two is likely to to throw our way. Um, that's, that's, that's really painful, but I mean, I understand that it's, it's, you know, that increases our capital. It would, if we added it, we would increase our capital request to the four towns by like 30 or 40%. So I understand that. Um, and if I, you could just get a short, short answer to the, what do we expect the reception to be for the 45% method? Could I actually, yeah, just comment on the, the capital. I think the other thing that's a little different in region than it is in some of the municipal districts is that each of the municipalities get funds, uh, receive funds from the CARES Act for COVID related items. But because the region is not a municipality or it, it sort of is a municipality, we're not, we can't, no one funded us uh, for the CARES Act. So the reason that stays in as opposed to municipal districts where we'll be just kind of flow through the towns is because we will have to request those funds. Now, likely those funds that each town contributes to that are reimbursable by the CARES Act. Um, but I just I do want to note that we have to request it very formally in the region because we are not part of a municipal government. Sorry to throw you. I, I know Mr. Deming had a different question, but I thought it was worth sharing that even though that is a capital expense, uh, that expense is likely to be funded for each town share via the CARES Act, um, not through their capital budget. Ms. Spitzer or, or Dr. Slaughter, did you have a follow up to that? Just uh, the one quick thing I will point out, just the mechanics of how the capital works is it typically, um, we approve it now, it doesn't actually hit the books for folks for a full year because it's borrowing. So we would borrow it next year and then would actually be in the in the uh, debt assessment to the districts, I mean, to the, to the member towns. So the, this is actually in viewing this list is thinking about what's going to hit the books in fiscal 22 for the communities. The, uh, the sort of debt assessment for fiscal 21 is fixed by the borrowing we did this spring. So those numbers are already in place, obviously not anticipating um, you know, the situation that's happened, but also recognizing we've already borrowed that money. So those, those debts will be due. 
Um, so I just want to paint that picture as far as the, some of the thinking around, you know, choices and the limitation on, on capital is, is that we expect fiscal 22 to be as difficult, if not more so than this year, and that uh, we're trying to sort of moderate the, the, the debt assessment to the communities. Ms. Fitzer? So um, I'm going to try not to talk too much about another committee I sit on, but um, for that other for the other committee, we've got kind of a, a, um, a council that we can go to to ask for additional funds. And I'm just thinking if if, if this 75,000 proves to be too low or the HVAC exhaust system or you know the exhaust fans do fail next year, what mechanism do we have to make improvements that are required um, either for COVID related reasons or because some mechanism in our school needs, needs immediate repair? Dr. Sutter, yeah. So one of the things we typically do uh, and traditionally did before we started a more significant capital planning process in the region was to use operating budget funds for those purposes. Um, obviously, as we're discussing, the, you know, the operating budget is going to be very you know, tight uh, next year. So the, the opportunity for that is going to be very lean. Um, the other option we have, if we need, you know, uh, additional revenue, would be to uh, seek, you know, permission from you as a regional school committee, and then subsequently permission from each of the the member towns to uh, have authorization to do additional borrowing at some point. Um, so that's really our recourse. And so, it, it, and when we, when we, particularly for debt authorization. Um, if the towns don't have an issue with it and they take no action, then it happens. Uh, it's if they wish to um, uh, vote on it and potentially vote no on it, then they have to for you know they have to actually call a town meeting. Um, if if the you know if we were mid fiscal year, something arose, we had communication with each of the select boards and communities, uh, and they you know were. Uh, for lack of a term, comfortable with with uh, some additional borrowing, if they took no action upon the notice that we're required to give, uh, then it would just become uh, a uh, a bill they would have to pay, which would be in fiscal 22 or 23, depending on how late in the year we would would do that borrowing. But that's sort of the mechanics of how it works. But I mean, typically we we offer this up in the spring so that it can be part of the annual town meeting for the communities and they can actually take an affirmative vote. Um, they're not required to. Ms. Fitzer? I just, I guess I just want to follow up on on that and say that, you know, I'm not proposing this, but I, I, I am still slightly uncomfortable with the fact that we, we really don't know what next year is going to look like. We haven't gotten the guidance from DESE. Um, we haven't gotten the guidance at all from the federal government in terms of what is school going to look like next year. And there's no doubt that's going to impact um, our budget, including our capital budget and our operating budget. So I'm, I'm hopeful we won't need to ask for more money, but I, I think it's very likely that um, we may need, we, we need to um, follow those paths that we just laid out. Are there other questions or comments from the committee? So we have, um, oh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, I don't mean to belabor the point, but I just wanted to get like a brief answer on what is our expected reception or, or is there no update on, on what we expect the four towns to um, uh, uh, receive the, the, the same 45% assessment method um, proposal? If there have been any conversations since we last discussed this in region. Dr. Marks. I can say it's been communicated, uh, you know, sent to, to folks in Leverett, for instance, today who are asking about it. Thanks, Ms. Seeger, for your work there. Um, been shared with Amherst. I can say confidently that Amherst um, has, has, it's in their guidelines, you know, with the number that, that's consistent with the 45 degree method. Um, I don't know if Dr. Slaughter has more to share in terms of your conversations in Pelham or um, if anyone has, it looks like Mr. Sullivan shoots very, but you know, the thing that I've heard more than the method this time around is the dollar amount. Um, just because I think the, the change in everyone's reality has shifted the focus at least temporarily perhaps 
uh, from assessment method to being able to fund the budget. Um, that's anecdotal. I can't extrapolate that much from it, but I've gotten more questions on the total dollar amount and less on the assessment method as compared to typical budget cycles. I don't know if Dr. Slaughter is more to add. Dr. Slaughter. Um, just that I've, you know, I've communicated with um, the Finance Committee in Pelham, uh, the chair of the Finance Committee in Pelham, to, to share with them what you have tonight in front of you as far as the budget for, for fiscal uh, 21. Uh, and I've shared similar information with the folks in, in Shootsbury. Uh, they posed a few questions last week as well. Again, I think, um, you know, everybody's uh, trying to sort of wrap their head around uh, what little information they have. And so I think to, to Dr. Morris's point, uh, it's more about sort of dollar amount as opposed to assessment method has been the questions I've gotten as well. Um, and just can we kind of get there? I think that um, we'll, we'll probably go back to conversations about assessment method a, a little later, but not, not right now. But I don't know any more detail on what actual thinking people have. Is there any further questions or comments? So uh, we do have some um, official uh, motion language that's included in our packet. Um, so um, we will need to go through each one of these one by one. if we are ready for a motion. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, except now I can't see everybody. <laughs> so, um, so if somebody has a motion, I would suggest you just speak. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Did somebody have a motion? Just means reading this language, Allison? Yes. Okay. I move that we adopt a budget of $32,145,531 for fiscal year 2021 for the Amherst Pelham Regional School District and to Number towns according to the method approved in the amendment voted 310 2020 as follows Amherst 16,404 no 16,404,120 Pelham $891,934 Leverett 1,473,000 dollars and Shootsbury, one million six hundred seventy-five thousand eight hundred and seventy-three dollars. Moved by Stancer. There a second. Second. Seconded by Demling. Um, and this vote uh, requires a two-thirds majority. Um, starting with uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Stancer. Oh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Seeger. <laughs> Seeger, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, the motion passes uh, nine to zero. And now we have a next uh, vote on debt authorization. Oh, uh, Dr. Slaughter. Sorry for the delay there. So I believe it's the modification of debt authorization. I just want to preface this a little bit. This is a technical fix. Um, so these authorizations were, were granted, I think two fiscal years ago at least. Um, and so one project came in a little under budget, one a little over budget. This is not changing the total amount of debt that was authorized, changing the purpose for which we can use the debt is all we're doing here. And so it's a technical fix. Um, 
to sort of dot I's and cross T's from a legal standpoint. So that's the purpose of that motion on modification of debt authorization. Any questions? Would someone like to read the motion? Mr. Demling. I move that in accordance with MGL chapter 44, section 20, the $5,000 unexpe unexpended balance of funds borrowed to pay costs of the middle school roof repairs, which amount is no longer needed to complete the project for which it was initially borrowed, is hereby appropriated by this school committee to pay additional costs of Summit Academy relocation renovation, including the payment of any and all costs incidental and related thereto. Second. Thank you. Moved by Demling and seconded by Spitzer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll, go, we'll vote. And this one also requires a two thirds majority. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Manino? Manino, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, so the motion uh, passes uh, nine to zero. And next we have another uh, motion regarding um, rescinding of previous capital planned bond authorization. Do you have a, a preface for that, Ms. Uh, Dr. Slaughter? <laughs> I do. Um, it, you know, while not required, um, the previous authorization that we gave uh, for a list of I think it was 11 or maybe 12 items you know in our march meeting uh uh for the closure of school uh you know authorized four hundred twenty five thousand dollars, and then of course as i spoke earlier process wise uh basically 60 day clock starts for the for the member towns to say no um and of course that clock expired uh we checked with our council relative to borrowing and they said yeah the rules didn't change relative to this so effectively you've got authorization um just thinking that you know we don't want to put uh, communities in uh, an uncomfortable situation relative to the authorized debt. Uh, authorized debt's not the same as actually borrowed money, but it's pretty close from the standpoint of bonding agencies and capacity to borrow and things like that. So uh, what we have here is a motion to rescind that vote, and then subsequently we will uh, basically authorize a new uh, capital plan plan bond authorization, um, which is obviously decidedly more modest in its scope. Um, and then we'll send out notice to the communities relative to that newer one after the fact. But this just uh, sort of frees up that authorization, uh, doesn't leave it sort of committed uh, by the, the four member communities. Okay. Uh, so would somebody, uh, somebody like to read this motion? Ms. Spitzer. Um. I move that the school district committee votes to rescind the 425,000 voted at a meeting held on March 10th, 2020. Moved by Spitzer. I second. Seconded by Ms. Dancer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll roll call vote and I'll, I'll go in a backwards order. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, I. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, I. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. Mr. Demling. Demling, I. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, I. And McDonald's, I. So the motion to rescind previous capital bland bond authorization is passes uh, nine to zero. Now we have a very long motion to uh, uh, authorize the the new capital plan bond. Um, would somebody like to read that motion? 
um, I will give it a try. Okay. <laughs> um, I move that the district hereby appropriates the sum of $115,000 for the purpose of paying costs of the following projects, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto. One, renovations of the walk-in cooler and freezer at the high school in the amount of $25,000. Two, grounds improvements at the high school in the amount of $15,000. And three, district-wide COVID-19 related equipment and material needs in the amount of $75,000, said sum to be expended at the direction of the Regional School District Committee. To meet this appropriation, the district treasurer is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 71, Section 16D of the General Laws and the district agreement as amended or pursuant to any other enabling authority. Any premium received upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this vote, plus any such a premium applied to the payment of the costs of issuance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this vote in accordance with chapter 44, section 20 of the general laws thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Further, um, that within 48 hours from the date on which this vote is adopted, the secretary be and hereby is instructed to notify the board of selectmen and town council of each of the member towns of this district in writing as to the amount and general purposes of the debt herein authorized as required by chapter 71, section 16D of the general laws and by the district agreement. In addition, the committee shall cause the same information to be published within 10 days after such authorization as a paid notice in a newspaper circulating in the district. Whew. I said, uh, thank you. Uh, moved by Stancer, seconded by Spitzer. Is there any further discussion on this? Seeing none, I move to roll call vote. Um, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously nine to zero. And I should have stated it required, it also required a two thirds majority, which we have. Um, and finally, um, a final motion on the addition of student activity accounts. Dr. Slaughter. Uh, again, a little bit of housekeeping. We would have taken care of this in March. Uh, these are two different organizations that normally would have been in the schedule of, of student activities accounts in the fall when you approve those. Um, they got it overlooked. They have some uh, income that needs to go into their sort of slice of the student activity so this authorization allows those accounts to be set up properly a pretty straightforward thing okay mr Demling. i move to approve the addition to the student activity accounts of the class of 2023 and middle school team midnight accounts lord second moved by Demling and seconded by lord any further discussion seeing none um, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes nine to zero. And I believe that's our final motion. 
uh, or uh, related to that, or, or final vote um, related to budget and assessment method. Great. So now, um, as discussed uh, before, we're going to move to item F on our agenda, which is the bus contract vote. And uh, I'll turn that over to uh, Dr. Morris or Dr. Slaughter to introduce. Uh, I could do a little bit, um, but this was a bus contract that we discussed and it didn't get approved because of everything that happened. And, and again, kind of got lost in the early days of uh, the closure and the things that come. Uh, nothing's changed in the bus contract, um, but it does require a vote of the school committee because at least has the potential to go beyond three years and based on state law, any contract that goes beyond um, that time length uh, requires a school committee vote. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's worth just mentioning that uh, it's a three-year contract with a two-year kicker that's at the district disposal or district's discretion. So what we would plan to do is to bring this contract up uh, in for years four and five uh, and to make sure that the school committee at that point wanted to extend it uh, because uh, but because as the potential to extend beyond three years uh, we thought it was wise to uh, it might actually play out that way so get a vote on the front end uh, seemed warranted um, just as a review for those of you who weren't on the committee uh, in the past we've had uh, five star bidded on uh, well both actually uh, bid on this and five star had the low bid uh, and met all the technical requirements for all the routes. Um, so we'd be going from two external vendors to one external vendor. I wanna be really clear, that's no negative statement towards Kosmeskis. Uh, they've been a really strong partner with us for many years, um, but the state, uh, the bid contracts to go the way the state law goes and the low bidder, as long as they meet the requirements, uh, wins the bid. And this year it was five star for both the, the Amerson Pelham routes, as well as the Shutesbury and Leverett routes. and that's the broad summary of the bus contract um, that we're asking you to approve tonight for the next, for starting in the next fiscal year. Are there any questions? Ms. Seeger. Uh, I'm curious of how much input you get from Leverett and Shutesbury in regards to um, you know, changes like this. And uh, I just can imagine, you know, getting used to having a set of people doing the bus routes for you. You know, this is going to be a change for our districts, obviously. And um, I'm just curious of what sort of input the two towns have. Dr. Slaughter, do you want to weigh in on that? Some of this occurred before you were in your role. So I know it's a little bit um, Awkward, but I know Mr. Mangano uh, did connect with Sheets Baron Leverett and their finance director along the way. I don't know if you have more that you want to add, Dr. Slaughter, more specific than that. Just a small amount, if that's all right. Um, you know, I think the, the the idea is that we, you know, the once the the uh, the bid goes out for or or the solicitation for bids goes out, it's it's a bit of a fait accompli as far as what it looks like and how it's structured. But nonetheless. Um, in that process, getting the bid constructed for release is one that we want to try to have and have it be a cooperative process. And uh, I wasn't a part of that, Mr. Mangano was, but I believe he reached out and was connected and and uh, you know took advice from the various uh, partners with us regarding that, as well as how we um, you know share those costs across the the, the communities. Any other questions? Ms. Dancer? Um, I'm wondering uh, if things don't go as they would have before the pandemic, when school starts again, what happens? Will there be conversation with the bus company about that? And is there the possibility for any kind of uh, coming to any kind of agreement with them like we did for this last period of time? Short answer is yes. Um, there will be differences in the fall one way or the other. Things will not, transportation will not function as it has typically. Uh, that's a broad conversation we'll have. Uh, again, I don't want to, I know you're ask, being asked to approve a contract this week. It's a conversation we'll have next week, uh, given CDC guidance about buses and transportation. Um, I think it would likely, the process would play out very similarly. Um, 
but uh, it's sort of a more complex conversation, frankly, than the spring, because the spring was about closure. Uh, next year might, there's a whole range of options that um, might involve different bus routes or different number of students on a bus or uh, different cleaning mechanisms that are re going to be required and, and maintenance of buses. Um, so uh, the long, the short story is yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a very similar contract to what we had, which allowed for negotiations when these situations came up. I think we're actually fortunate we have the contract that was written prior to this playing out because there's, um, I think it's more advantageous to the district than if it allowed for, frankly, more protections for the for bus companies when they were making their bids uh, for the scenario that was unanticipated. So um, I think that's as much as I can say right now. Any other comment or question? Okay. Um, I don't think we have specific um, motion language on this one. So if anybody would like to make a motion. Mr. Demling. I move to approve the five-star transportation contract uh, as presented. I'll second. Moved by Demling and seconded by Seeger. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, and the motion passes unanimously nine to zero. I'm changing up the order just to keep everybody on their toes. <laughs> uh, great. So now uh, moving back to the order um, on our agenda, we're moving back to item A on our um, published agenda, and this is the COVID-19 school update from Dr. Morris. Uh, you're muted. Yep, sorry about that, I realized it. <laughs> nice people at Google told me. Um, and uh, I'll be very brief uh, because we're gonna spend a lot of time on this next week. So, um, I think uh, the three things I want to share is one, well, there's a um, an art show that's usually done publicly in the spring uh, featuring the work of our high school students. That's gonna be done virtually, but I'll send out information uh, to the whole community about that tomorrow. Uh, but you know, people are continuing to find ways where student work can be exhibited uh, in really unique and, and wonderful ways. I know I played the music last time, but I just want to highlight uh, the work of our, our educators to be inventive in this, uh, this very, very difficult time uh, to be connecting with kids. Uh, the second thing I'd like to share is that we've had um, just incredible conversations with the fall planning groups. You know, I sat in on, on a distance learning group at the secondary level, a couple of the other groups working on, you know, one working on facilities, a couple working on other things. And so people are actively uh, doing work to come up with guiding principles. And I wanna thank, um, it's over a hundred staff members we're contributing to one group or another. We did create a group that's specifically focused on preschool. Um, I'll explain why in a second. And then as well as one looking at special ed specialized programs, um, because those felt like the more, the deeper we got into them, the more they needed to be unique conversations. The third is that if you drive around town, particularly around the town common, you'll see uh, some wonderful signs uh, all around um, in our communities for the graduates. Um, the staff put them and found graduates, including our school choice students who don't live in our four communities. Uh, it's a little hard. This seems like a very competitive select board race in Shootsbury, Mr. Sullivan, but you drive around Shootsbury, you'll see uh, a fair number of uh, Amherst High School graduate signs as well, uh, You know, adding to that landscape of signs that's all over the town of Shootsbury. Uh, but downtown, there's individual signs with individual student spaces on them. And, uh, it's just been really nice and the town of Amherst has been very wonderful in allowing us to use some of the common area space uh, that we have. The third thing I'd like to share uh, sort of crosses over into uh, 
kind of the third and fourth in some ways. The CDC last week, a week ago, um, offered a 60 so 60 page or so document. Uh, four pages were dedicated to schools about reopening. Um, and next Wednesday night, we'll have um, a joint school committee meeting between Amherst, Pelham, and the region, uh, where we'll we'll dig into that document and the relevant parts and talk about the implications for fall. Um, that's a little different than the guiding document. Um, I'll be really candid. We haven't received guidance from DESA yet. Their group didn't start meeting till about two or three weeks ago, the 27-person committee. Um, and so, uh, well, I'd rather in some ways wait um, to receive it. I think what we've found, and this isn't a criticism of DESI, it's just a capacity issue that everyone's facing. Uh, we can't wait forever to start having conversations about fall and particularly want to start having those conversations while staff are still at work this spring. Um, and so it, it's not, you're not going to get a recommendation from me necessarily, but it is going to be a compilation of our teams thinking about what are potential options for fall. Uh, I do want to say that I've shared, I've contacted um, Ms. Colkeen, Superintendent Colkeen uh, of Union 28, and we're talking later this week because uh, we do want to um, approach that, but we are thinking of an, a regional approach to at least thinking about options. And I will say that it will be, um, it may be startling to people what the CDC guidance says and the implications. I don't wanna preview it too much, but I, I can't say that enough because uh, the short story is it won't be school as normal. Uh, no option will involve school as normal uh, as we think about fall. Um, so uh, another question I got recently is, are we gonna take the CD guide, CDC guidance seriously? And, and the answer to that is yes, that's, uh, the CDC guidance has been criticized a lot in education circles because it doesn't seem like they've, you know, the criticism is it doesn't seem like they've been in a school. Um, but I don't think that's their job. Like our job is to take that guidance, look at options and say, what can we do? What can't we do? Uh, <laughs> and we'll have some forced choices that the committees and people like myself have never had to make before uh, about uh, how to approach this. Um, and I sort of referenced it earlier, I'll probably reference it again. That conversation is going to be a multi-meeting uh, conversation. I do think uh, the amount of planning that uh, administrative staff as well as teaching staff will have to do to prepare for whatever model we do it, uh, is, is like we've never seen before over a three-month period. And so I think it behooves us uh, to start that conversation. I'd love to just be able to blame something on Desi and wait till it comes out and, and say that. I don't actually think that's in our students' uh, best interest. I think it's in our students' best interest to start engaging the, the, the committee and the community on what are potential options so people can weigh in uh, and narrow our choices down. But, but again, it, it'll be a sobering meeting, I think, for, for people to really take a look at um, both what we're able to do and, and frankly, what we're not able to do. Um, and it'll really be, there was a really good article I saw recently and a couple of you actually, multiple people uh, pointed me to it, but just talked about uh, we're all, everyone in the community is going to have some shared sacrifice to, to make the operation work, uh, work best for students. And the reason it's a, it's a uh, joint meeting is I think we need to actually think about this in a K to 12 context um, and not in a um, just regional context because that collaboration and and, and sharing of resources is going to have to be thought about in a multi-district context. It's going to be a little complicated for us, but I'd rather be complicated and awkward and us move forward than avoid the conversation uh, until an external body who doesn't understand what a three-district K-12 organization looks like and four or five district, if you include Shoots Fair and Leverett, um, those school committees uh, has to have. So that's long-winded, but I did want to preview that a little bit uh, for you for next week. And we're, we're working really hard to get a document that makes sense to the committee, makes sense to the community. I'm sorry, I'm just tickled seeing Mr. Sullivan's dog. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, um, and work on it with you. And I think the last thing that I'll share is just, uh, you know, we're, we are nearing towards the end of the year. Um, sounds it feels weird because this time doesn't operate i think everyone in every profession and in every industry recognizes that time operates really differently now than it did two and a half months ago um but i really want to thank our staff for stepping up in all sorts of different ways uh to make this whole thing work one of the the, the best conversation i had all day was with this distance learning it was a team of secondary educators from the region who were talking about you know it was just simple prompt you know what's worked well this spring you know what would we want to rethink and the thing that worked well, and the thing we'll have to rethink if we're in any kind of distance environment for next year, uh, is frankly that people had relationships with their students that were built up over at least six, seven month period of time. Um, and so that sustained 
uh, some of the distance learning. And I think one of the things that we'll have to think about, regardless of our setting, regardless of whether it's in-person distance or some hybrid next year, regardless of physical use of buildings, is that st our students aren't going to be returning with those, phys uh, those personal relationships with their instructors intact in the same way. Um, and that's gonna be a large variable for us to, to be thinking about uh, how do we approach in the fall? Because um, it's, it's gonna be a very different dynamic that way. Um, sorry, that was longer, long winded. I said it was gonna be quick, I lied. Um, but um, but it, it'll be much more long winded next week, I'll put it that way. Um, but you know, I think it is gonna be a meeting, probably people wanna tune in and watch um, and, and, and get a sense of uh, what fall could look like and what choices we really have to make and what choices are, are essentially made from us from our public health perspective. Um, and that's going to be really difficult and different. Mr. Menino. Next week's meeting is Tuesday or Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Uh, I think there will be a, uh, you don't have a quorum of Pelham, so I think there's a, there will be a brief Pelham meeting before that instead of that Thursday meeting as originally scheduled, but I'm meeting with Ms. Hall tomorrow morning and we'll get it out by the afternoon just so everyone has it on their calendars. But Wednesday. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just wanted to say briefly, you know, I appreciate the the schedule that you're taking with this. I think it's the right move to go ahead um, prior to DESE guidance. I mean, I really don't, and we, we batch DESE all the time for a number of different things. And I mean, at the end of the day, this is this is kind of a political power call at the state level. And I mean, you know, Jesse's headed by the education and commissioner and, and an education commissioner who I, I have criticisms of, but isn't in my view really the state political power player. It's really the governor and the ed secretary about how soon they want to take the lead on this and they're not. So, you know, I think this is the right call. Um, I also think it's the right call to talk about what you referenced as startling possibilities as soon as possible. I think I think the bigger the change and the bigger the idea, there's always this tension, right, between wanting to say it early so they can get people's reaction and feedback, but not wanting to do it too early um, when people might assume that an idea is already baked and and, and so how, how do you balance that? And I think I think in this case, um, you know, some of these ideas, and I don't I don't know what you're talking about, but, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I've, uh, ex I've experienced the acclimation process of enough of this aspects of the COVID-19 experience, enough to know that it's some of these things take time to marinate on, you know, you're going to hear it for the first time and you, you just have to sit with it um, before you then come back to it. And um, so I expect a lot of listening on our part <laughs> Um, next week. And um, I think it's good to be able to advertise and share this with the community that, you know, this this is not exactly, we, we don't know, this may change, you know, but we are coming to the community with ideas that are not fully formed yet because we want people to get a sense of what's, of what is possible. Um, I, th I think that's the honest, most transparent way to do it. So I, I appreciate the tax you're taking with that. Um, and and I will I will second um, everything that Mr. Demling just said about sort of the timing and the and the tack and the approach on this too, um, Dr. Morris. Yep, just about, thank you for that. And yeah, I think I drew the short lot of our Western Mass group, and I think it just our ours got scheduled first. But uh, that I think there's some there's some benefit to that as well. The last thing is just speaking of Desi, that Desi uh, to as of when this meeting started, I haven't checked my email since. Um, did, has still not made a determination determination about whether in school summer school services can begin. Um, they did say you can contact your local public health department on Friday. They told us that in the morning. We contacted the Amherst Health Department on Friday afternoon. Uh, looking at the CDC guidance, um, the health department, um, the director uh, wrote a letter which was shared with the school committee that uh, given that summer school would start, you know, more or less five weeks from now, we don't have enough time to implement the CDC guidance to get the right materials, PPE, all that stuff that's recommended. Um, and she strongly recommended us not having summer programming in the building. As such, we'll be, we are transitioning, which was what we were anticipating, to having summer school be virtual. We're offering it to all students with, um, typically it was for special education students who were, um, did not, could show that there was regression over the summer. We're actually uh, offering it to all special education students um, at the regional at the regional level um, because we know that um, accessing virtual learning has been more of a challenge for some students than others. Uh, not everyone has to avail themselves of it, but we're offering it to all students uh, in a virtual context. 
Um, but I think it really gets to some of the urgency I feel to uh, come out with larger kind of pieces of implications because um, I'll just, again, I, I'm not out to bash DESI, it's not my goal. It's really a capacity question. Um, I agree with Mr. Demling's assessment of where the, who makes which decisions, uh, but to not have a decision on May 26th about whether summer school can start, given the amount of planning that would be needed to allow students to be in summer school um, in this context, um, essentially makes the decision for us. And it is one of the challenges that, um, that we're facing is uh, if we don't, if we allow, if we're passive in this moment, um, we put a lot of families and a lot of staff through an incredible amount of stress uh, that, that seems unwarranted. And, and I think it will be more challenging for the general conversation about fall uh, just engaging it earlier, setting broad parameters, talking about broad implications. Um, we're not going to disregard the CDC guidance, no matter what DESE says, just to be very blunt about it. DESE says disregard it. I'm going to have a hard time disregarding CDC guidance on public health. Um, and so we're going to jump in and we'll see where we land with how that conversation conversations go. And that's my update. Are there any questions? I'm going to um, also, um, I don't want to um, call you out, um, but um, uh, Ms. Gripko, if you if you have any questions or comments, um, you're welcome to um, share them. Everybody just raises their hand when they when they want to speak, um, so I won't put you on the spot, but I'll keep an eye on in case I see your hand up. Um, I, have, I have one question, and I don't, um, uh, we may have talked about it, so I apologize if we've talked about this before, but programs such as um, like the the Vela program at at the middle school, are those are there plans for some remote option similar to that for those students? Because those aren't all special ed students. No, Vela, right? Vela is a after school program at our middle school. It's run uh, through collaboration with the um, collaboration uh, collaborative for educational services over in Northampton, and they actually similar to our well not similar, analogous in some ways to special ed, they are running a virtual summer program and they're opening it up um, for all students um, so that the access point are greater because some of the some of the odd benefits, I guess, of the virtual environment is the limitation of number of students uh, gets a little bit easier um, in some ways. So that program is happening, but it's happening in a virtual context. Yeah. Same with our credit recovery system for the high school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, great. Um, so we'll move on to the next item, which is uh, the, the consideration of the vote for the draft resolution for the increased federal funding. Um, and this is, uh, Mr. Downing, I don't know if you want to, um, if you had any intentions to introduce this, but we, we reviewed this, um, this document at our last meeting um, uh, this is, Mr. Demling drafted this based on um, uh, a similar resolution that the Boston School Committee had drafted um, and voted on, um, and it was adjusted, amended um, with our data and our particular district um, information and um, characteristics. So we, we reviewed it last at our last meeting, and we all wanted time to be able to read it ahead of time because it had only gotten into our packet that day. So. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything more that you want to add right now, Mr. Demling. No, um, it's unchanged since the last time it was presented at our last meeting. Um, I don't see it in the current packet, so I can't display it, but it is unchanged. So, uh, I mean, we can, we can either vote it without it being in the packet or we can, I'm assuming next meeting is going to be fairly packed. So I don't know if we want to add it to that agenda, but, um, you know, we, whatever the committee is comfortable with. How do, uh, how do folks feel about, um, I don't, I'm trying to see if I can find um, the last one quickly. Oh, you, Dr. Morris can display it. Great, thank you. So while Dr. Morris is doing that, I could just do the 10 second recap, which is, uh, this is essentially calling for a, another very large funding bill um, for for public schools, uh, given that what's already been allocated is around 
10 to 13 billion from the federal level and uh and what re is really needed uh, uh, based on the Great Recession as, as kind of a benchmark and also based on what um, many educational organizations are asking for is, is more around 200 billion. Uh, and if we, if we leave schools out to dry, then that's, um, it's really leaving frontline education service and employment providers that are essential to our community. And we should not do that. <laughs> so calling for the federal funding and, uh, you know, um, our, our, our reps are, are all on board. Our federal level our reps are all on board with this, which is great. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see a big visible battle a, a, across the country um, for this, um, but, but we don't know. Um, so this is, this is kind of that, that big shoe that if it drops, it, it would be great, so. Dr. Morris. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one thing I learned in a session I was in last week with someone who did a little analysis is compared to the Great Recession, uh, which gave uh, K-12 plus higher ed uh, adjusted, inflate, uh, adjusted for inflation about $130 billion. Um, so far, we're at, um, we're under 30 um, in terms of what's been approved for K-12 to plus higher ed. Uh, and obviously this crisis, this fiscal crisis looms much larger, frankly, than, than the Great Recession did. Um, so I just want to support Mr. Demling's point about the need for this. And um, if you look at research on the, the Great Recession, even with that funding, uh, we saw a reduction in spending, particularly in districts that spend, uh, that are more reliant on state and federal aid. Uh, and we saw reduced results in those communities. And those communities uh, have higher percentages of low-income students, as well as higher communities, or higher percentages of students of color. So I think in addition to anything that I would do for the Amherst Public Schools, which is significant, also thinking about um, the educational debt uh, piece and what the the potential for this to be uh, in, just incredibly widen the educational debt challenges that we face, uh, not just in Amherst and, and the four towns, but also uh, across the country. So I just want to lend my voice of strong support for Mr. Dem what Dem Mr. De Mr. Demling worked on. Great. Um, so, um, unless somebody else would like to move or any further discussion? Nope. So, um, I'll make a motion to, um, to approve and sign um, the this resolution and submit this resolution for increased federal funding um, to sign it and um, submit it to our uh, state representatives in um, uh, Washington. Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Menino. Any further discussion? Dr. Morris. Again, not to belabor the point, but I wonder, and, and I don't think it needs to be voted by the committee, but if, if the chair or the author want uh, the district to send it out to anyone else, um, the press, the um, other MASC, anybody like that, we'll just take direction from either the chair or the chair and the author of this. Uh, we're happy to facilitate it being sent out um, so maybe more committees and, and other people may pay attention um, to the good work that potentially gets voted on in a second. So we're happy to help. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. McDonald, aye, and Ms. Seeger abstained. Or I should say not present, not abstain. Um, great. Uh, so uh, Mr. Demling, why don't we follow up afterward after this meeting about how we want to proceed with um, where we want to, where we want to send this. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, warrants report. Um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Spitzer. Do you, if you have any warrants to report? 
um, I do, I assigned to this afternoon. So, um, so I authored and revised my signature, my signature to its payables in the amount of $744,802.08 for a warrant dated May 27th, 2020. In addition, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $629,971.64, which was completely for general fund expenses. And that one was dated, I already gave the date, sorry, it was May 14th, 2020 and I signed that today, May 26th. Those are the only two, I believe. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the next item, which is our superintendent um, instrument and timeline vote. And I believe um, based on an earlier conversation, um, what we'd like to do tonight is simply vote to um, have a or dis discuss and um, vote for a later date um, to be determined for our uh, superintendent evaluation. Um, I don't know, uh, Ms. Spitzer, would you like to add anything? Sure. So just to update the committee, um, I'm in the process of working with the administrative team to have the instrument finalized. Um, hopefully that'll be, I have a feeling it might happen after Wednesday after graduation. Um, but um, in the meantime, because the contract states that we will um, complete the evaluation prior to June 1st and um, with everything that's happened, that's clearly not gonna happen. So we're just asking for a vote to postpone the evaluation to later this summer. Is there any um, questions from anybody on the committee? <laughs> Ms. Stanford, picture. Um, so, just to make sure I understand, so you simply need a vote to say we're going to do it after June first. We aren't setting a particular date at this point. That is correct. Okay. Any other questions? And I'm going to, um, as a formality, um, Dr. Morris, are you amenable to this approach to this timeline? Yes. Um, great. Somebody want to make a motion? Ms. Um, Stinker. I move that we postpone the superintendent evaluation deadline for some time after June 1st. I'll second that. Moved by sec moved by Stancer and seconded by McDonald. Any further discussion? Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. McDonald, aye. And Seeger, not present. So the motion passes um, eight, zero, and one not present. Um, having to do math at the end of a long meeting is, is challenging. <laughs> um, Okay, next on our agenda is agenda planning. Um, so as mentioned, we are um, going to be meeting again uh, next Wednesday to begin our planning for fall 2020. Gonna... Do you have our, uh, our uh, table handy, Dr. Morris, that you could share? So a, a single item agenda, agenda item meeting um, next week, and then we meet again on June 9th. Um, OK, 
Can you explain what a SOA plan is, Dr. Morris? Sure, that's the Student Opportunity Act. Um, so the legislature pushed back the date. The Student Opportunity Act plan needs to be voted to June 15th. Uh, my understanding is they're going to push it back later, but this is a caveat or a placeholder in case they don't push it back. Um, I think they're going to have to push everything back because the Student Opportunity Act dictated you'd have to say how you'd spend the additional money that was coming in. Um, bluntly, I don't think there's additional money coming in. So I think there's some conversations about what they're even going to do with that, but I just don't want to forget about it in case, in case the legislation doesn't change fast enough, which we've seen some examples of that, you know, will we'll fulfill the contractual pieces. The draft is already done. It's been sitting for two months. Um, but it just, uh, I think we won't actually have to do that, but I don't want to forget about it and then be caught without it being submitted on time or adding a last minute meeting just so we do it. And is the FY21 budget, is that? I think that that was on there just for an update uh, based on how things are going at the towns and when town meetings are planned. Um, yeah. not, not necessarily for the actual budget, the, vote, the budget was voted tonight. Um, but if there's any questions that come up from the towns, we typically at the regional level try to have a meeting before town meetings so that um, everybody is on the same page. And if there is some information that needs to be presented, um, that we have a plan for that. And, and I think town meetings in all three of the towns are going to be different this year. So I think it's just it's worthy to, again, at least have a conversation so that the regional committee can be organized before um, votes are taken in each member town. And then uh, lastly, we've added um, for also for June 9th, um, an, an introduction of uh, our discussion on whether we want to consider later start times as we're um, looking at what fall 2020 and beyond will, will be looking like. Is there, um, do we want to sort of add this and include this in, in our committee work and discussions? Um, so that, uh, uh, before the before the summer planning is, is sort of the idea here to get that um, have the committee address that this is something that we've talked about in past meetings and and have um, put on our list of possible things that we wanted to talk about so um, placing that placeholder right here to at least come back at that and see if this is something that we want to consider as a committee I think the only thing they'll be added need to be added, and we'll just I'll, I'll Ms. McDonald and I wait for Ms. Spitzer's lead. It's just superintendent evaluation, and we'll just we'll map that out once we have more information. Yeah, but we can easily add that whenever. Correct. Good. Thank you, Mr. Denling. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I did see the items on there that had the artifacts on the 23rd, and then the instrument due three days later in the middle of the week. I thought that I, I, that might be kind of pushing it. Um, <laughs> And that, that was um that was yeah we we should probably like just put sort of take them off for now until yeah, okay. that that's right, that's right. I just want to make sure yeah yeah no I that was that was me trying to figure out how we could possibly squeeze it in by June thirtieth and <laughs> so. and I and I think by do that exercise shows the absurdity of trying to get it done at that time frame. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, Ms. Stancer. Um, I have a question, which is, are we going to have additional meetings during the summer this year in light of the, the planning for the fall? We, it, that's a great question. And I, I think we, we haven't made that decision. And I'm wondering, Dr. Morris, if that might be something that we can add to our agenda for next uh, for next week, once we know sort of more of what's ahead of us in terms of planning for the fall. Yeah, I think there's four parts to next week's meeting. The first part's gonna be just a, a quick update on distance learning, uh, both how it's gone locally and what the research base would say. The second part's gonna be about CDC guidance and implications for the elementary, middle school, and high school. The third part's gonna be given that guidance and what we know about distance learning, what are potential options uh, for fall 2020. And the fourth part's gonna be, uh, how do we engage the public, communicate, what additional information do you need? What information uh, can you offer us so we have some direction? Because uh, it's way too big a pot uh, or kettle um, to have everything uh, ready for, um, you're not gonna see a plan next week, you're gonna see models. Um, 
and um, and and that model is almost a too strong a word. Um, and so uh, part of that last step is going to be what does the administration and staff do, but also how do we continue to engage? Um, I don't see it being something resolved incredibly soon. I would anticipate there being a need for more regular summer meetings than what has happened in the past. Uh, but I, I think that fourth part of next week's meeting after the long, pretty lengthy presentations and question and answer will be where do we want to go from here? And I mean the collective we, uh, to be very candid with the school committee, the administration, but where does the community, uh, how do we do that? Because I, I think something you've heard me say before is there's two things here. There's public health and there's public confidence. Uh, one is clearly more important than the other, but I think uh, in, in the overall scheme of things, but they're both equally important of how do we make decisions uh, and how are people going to feel comfortable uh, thinking about fall. Um, and uh, I will just, and again, I don't want to overdo this, but the decisions that we collectively, uh, not just people on this call, but the collectively in the community are going to have to make are ones we haven't had to consider before. And, and so I think that's going to need time to to marinate. That's going to be, people are going to ask questions, going to make all of us think about things differently. Um, and it's not going to be an easy fix or a quick, uh, that's the obvious best option. Even if we do have an obvious best option, how to implement it's going to be its whole nother uh, layer. So uh, I can't imagine going through summer without having some regularity of meetings um, because I do think it's really important that uh, you as elected officials of the four communities uh, and the staff are continuing to talk about this in public, uh, continuing to answer questions and continue to refine uh, what's going to be the best possible solution given the context. And, and that's really the way I frame it, the best possible solution. It's not going to be the best solution. It's not out there. Thank you. I'm very dour today. Sorry about that. But, you know, it's it's, uh, it's the nature of uh, being honest about where we are and what we're thinking about. Any other questions on agendas? No? Um, I just just had have a comment. So I started to look at that draft from from the Maryland schools, and it really brought home to me how broad and how serious this whole thing is. Yeah. Um, so that document is a draft document, but it's available on a public website about Maryland's uh, fall reentry plans. And I think what will be even more, uh, what will reemphasize that point, so to speak, next week is when you start taking a broad document like that and trying to localize it in a three district um, organization with buildings that have some structural issues, uh, the layers of complication um, get very real very quickly. But I do feel to the points earlier, and I don't want to belabor this, but uh, you know, because originally Ms. Ms. McDonald, Ms. Hall, and I were actually talking about doing this week, and with the budget votes and just my my capacity of wanting to do this well, uh, I just didn't feel like I could do it. But I'm feeling urgency to start talking about this in public and with the committee, uh, because there's some things we actually know now that the CDC has issued their guidance. Um, and I think the sooner we engage in that and educate the community, uh, the more informed our conduct our uh, our discussions will be over time. I think the longer we wait, I think people may not be um, aware of some of the specificity of the CDC guidance. And uh, we want to get that out as soon as possible, as awkward and, and painful as it's going to be. I usually am a very happy person, by the way. I usually am like, you know, this is not my my normal. I think you all have known me well long enough to know that I, I tend to be a half glass, half glass, glass half full kind of person. But, um, you know, uh, I think the thing that makes me feel confident is we're working through it together. And that's what we're going to do. And if, if there's anything I know about crises, it, it takes collaboration and communication from the community to make best possible solutions. So we'll get at it. Mr. Menino, did you have something? No, except to say that if the glass is half empty, it's half empty. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, we do have um. You you you'll, uh, you'll have a chance to sort of turn your your glass half full into glass full tomorrow with the with uh, graduation. So um, that will be uh, moving on. Um, okay, great. So uh, moving right along, we have some gifts to accept. Mr. Menino, would you like to read the gifts? Okay, but 
somebody's blocking their top line. <laughs> I would like to present the following donations listed below for your approval. Uh, the beneficiaries and the descriptions are as follows. Donor, Barbara James Pistang, number 1790, to support the Amherst Regional High School Arms Ultimate Scholarship, $1,000. Subtotal $1,000. In compliance with state regulations regarding the receipt of gifts, I suggest that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee officially accept these donations at its next finance, next scheduled meeting. Grant Project Red number 100165 to support COVID rapid response. Total $2,000. Subtotal $2,000. So I, I move that we accept the gifts as presented by Mr. Menino. Second. Second by, was that Ms. Stancer? Yeah, moved by McDonald, second by Stancer. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Oh. Sorry, um, <laughs> moving to a roll call vote with Ms. Lord saying aye, Mr. Harrington. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, it passes uh, eight to zero. Okay. Moving on, we caught up all of our last time. Uh, Mr. Demling. Move to adjourn. Second. Moved by Demling, second by Spitzer. There's no discussion. Um, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amherst Media.